We have Professor Anthony Pym here today, so we are taking the opportunity to ask him a few burning questions we have. Mm -hmm. So welcome to New Zealand, Anthony. It's good to be here. Right, so I want to ask you first of all, as a translation theorist, what does it actually feel like uh, relocating yourself? You know, you've just recently been in Melbourne from Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, does that affect any uh, your thinking about translation theories? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the reasons why I've moved from Spain to Melbourne, at least for the moment, uh, do reflect what I want to do with translation, with research. I don't really like theory about itself. I think mm -hmm. creating knowledge, research is what we have to be in to. Uh, Melbourne's incredibly attractive as a multicultural, multilingual city that's very aware of that, that it wants to promote it as its identity. It's going to invest resources in that. And Melbourne University is very interested in, 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 uh, in studying what's going on. And I think that's the challenge of all our cities all over the world. Uh, because there are movements of people happening at a level that's unprecedented, uh, being able to form a viable policy, a governable group of people that share a common language, which, which is recognized in Australia, and that's an advantage for me, uh, but uh, want to retain those differences and all those other languages, providing social services, creating social harmony, living together, creating a new form of urban identity is the huge challenge that we've got. And I think, well, my bet was that Melbourne would be in the vanguard of that. Mm -hmm. And so far, I think that was not a bad bet. Mm -hmm. uh, the support I've got, the kinds of people I work with there, especially the social linguists, applied linguistic people, are, are really good. And I'm enjoying that part of it tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, just mm -hmm. a footnote there. I mean, I'm engaged in a, a project now, a European project on multilingualism and mobility in Europe mm -hmm. called MIME. And, uh, and a lot of the work I'm doing there, um, I, I'm bringing it across, those the questions we've got. The big difference is in Europe, people do not accept the idea that we will have a, a common lingua franca, mm. that, we, that the younger generations are moving towards the use of English as a common language. Mm. And the generation of linguists and researchers that I belong to is living in denial of that. Mm. They really mm. believe that you will have separate national languages operating in separate national spaces, mm. uh, at least to a, to a, to a greater extent. Mm. That is the case in Australia. So for me, that's a big advantage. Mm. Uh, I feel much freer to be able to, to say what I think in the Australian situation rather okay. than in the European situation. Right. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting situation because you are originally from Australia, but you have been yeah, operating yeah. outside of Australia, mainly based in Europe. Yeah. So how does that play out, the coming back to well, the... I, I'm from really person. traditional Anglo-Australia. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm not coming back to the same country. All right. I think mm. it's much better now than it was. I mean, I spent mm. most of my life outside of Australia. Mm. Uh, so what, 30 years or so in Spain, uh, Spain and the United States. Um, yeah, I, I have trouble identifying with the Anglo Mm. part of Australian culture, mm. I must admit. Mm. Right, yeah. right. And I'm very enthusiastic about this new Australia that's being created. Mm. 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 All right, so I'm just going to ask you the current projects you mentioned, one European project, but do you have any book projects in mind? Um, hold on. No, there's, there's one project that I really want to do in yes. Melbourne, and yes. it's, it's a um, repeating a project that was done in the late 1990s, the data was collected there. Mm -hmm. It's in its own um, uh, faith-based communities, uh, churches in Melbourne, mm -hmm. and the languages they use. Mm -hmm. And it's quite incredible to see uh, that the church communities have maintained, in many cases, their linguistic diversity mm -hmm. over the years, mm -hmm. and they find a whole range of practical solutions to communication problems. It's not just, you know, translations are done and you've got interpreters Yes, uh, interpreting some sermons in church, but a whole lot of other mixes of, of, of possible um, language learning, passive language learning, intercomprehension, a whole lot of things are happening there in these faith-based communities. It's not language for information, it's language for being together and feeling together as well as mm. effective use of language, mm. which I think we've forgotten about, mm -hmm. and it's the most powerful 
cause of problems as well as being the most powerful thing that brings people together. Um, so I've started to look at that and get that ready to go. And I'm very enthusiastic about that mm. kind of, it's really social linguistic research with mm -hmm. translation and interpreting mm -hmm. being, being part of it. That's, that's fascinating okay. because when we look back at the history, churches really did make use of technologies as well. Like for example in Salt, Salt Lake City, they are really into Sistram mm -hmm. because they oh, wanted to really, you know, help their evangelical activities by using machine translation. So in your yeah. picture of this church, multilingual communication, does technology come into it at all? Not, not a lot, but, but you can see that the young people uh, to follow, I mean, they're, they're, there is language loss, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's quite tragic. But to keep up with what's going on, they're using the Google Translate online mm -hmm. stuff. You know, those kinds of basic free technologies mm -hmm. are being used by the younger generations, not by the older ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's not, the churches themselves are not, they, they've got a lot of money to invest <laughs> in. They're, they're not Mormons. Mormons have got lots of money. Yeah, they can right. go into yeah, machine yeah, translation. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm really interested in people finding solutions themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we as academics have to look at that and learn from them and the mm -hmm. reasons why they opt for one or, or another. Yes, yeah. That's really sociology of translation, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, translation yeah, sociology. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think the important thing though, is to move away from this image of country one, country two, mm. and, 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 yeah, a, and a message okay. going yeah. across. It's happening within a community. Yeah. Sure. Uh, which, which changes a whole lot of things. Right. Yeah. I look forward to seeing that. Okay. But book project. One book I am struggling to write, it's just not getting written, but I want to do it. Mm. And somebody will do it if I don't do it. So, <laughs> so if you want to write a good book, <laughs> How to translate. Mm. Just basic tricks of the trade mm. for people who are doing it and, and just have no idea. Mm. Because so many people out there are, are translating and have had no guidance whatsoever. Mm. And they're translating with online machine translation. Mm. So it's really how to post edit, but mm. that's become how to translate. Mm. So that's, mm. that's the book I'm working on when I get a free moment. Mm. There are not many free moments mm. though. Interesting. You mean moment. language independent? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. With lots of examples from different languages, mm. yeah. But, right. but I really think there's a need for that kind of basic instruction right. about mm. you know what online machine translation is not and mm. what you can do with it and how mm. that can be built into <clears throat> all the tricks of the trade mm. <clears throat> that professional translators employ. Right. I think everybody has a right to know what we do. Brilliant. Oh. I'm sure that would be best there. If if uh, for, well, you you write it then. <laughs> <laughs> That's, All right, well, thank you. That's, that's, nice. that's very interesting, actually, Anthony, because that's happening in New Zealand as well, uh, which is um, one of the countries with the most ethnically, culturally, you know, linguistically diverse populations in the world, um, especially so here in Auckland, Auckland yeah. right? Uh, which has a super diverse population with a uniquely high proportion of, of indigenous people. So most of the training that um, so-called language experts uh, are receiving is primarily provided by either translation services or the Department of Business and Innovation or the Department of Internal Affairs. So that kind of training is taking place outside the realm of, of the tertiary education sector. Um, and we know little about how that training is, is being provided. So in, in an environment of, again, of increasingly changing demographics, how do you think, in a nutshell, that translators and, and interpreters can help bring about that multilingual democratic involvement in society? Well, I think it's false to think that translators and interpreters are the solution mm. or should in any way be responsible for it. I mean, it's part of what you want to have available. Mm. And I know my colleagues at Monash University Melbourne have a project with the Victoria government to provide short-term training to the mm. people who need it, in interpreting yes. especially. But uh, the project we, we have in Europe has been working with um, asylum seekers mm -hmm. in, uh, in Ljubljana and in Leipzig. And those studies are quite remarkable about the extent to which the asylum seekers and refugees mistrust translators. They do, they do not want a translator or an interpreter there. If they can do it themselves, they'll do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Why, basically because they think the, the translator or interpreter is working for the, the host government to, mm -hmm. to throw them out. Mm -hmm. But also, 
they see their image as, as long-term integration into a new society, and they know that language learning is the most important task that they've got. Mm. So they're going to use that help when it's available in high-risk situations mm. where it's legally necessary, but they're also going to use all the online technologies. Young people are always using online technologies to check on them and to learn themselves and to learn the new languages themselves. Mm. So what we're seeing is uh, a surprising degree of mistrust in mm. mediated communication and uh, equally surprising, the use of the mediation materials as a language learning device. Mm. Uh, so for, for too long we've had this thing that you know, translation, translation studies is one thing, language bilingualism, language, language learning is another, another thing, thing. Mm. but when you get down on the ground, yes. no, they're being used together Absolutely. in very creative ways. And I think mm. our academic disciplines have to overcome our long-term hurdles. Yes. I mean, at the beginning, translation studies wanted to establish itself as an independent mm. discipline. Mm. So we said, right, you know, but we're not bilingualism, we're not mm. language learning, translation is something different. Mm. But when you get down to it, it's not. Yeah, so, so you're yeah. seeing a return? To, to I think we really have to, to enter into a long-term dialogue with uh, the people in language education mm -hmm. because of what's happening there, but also because you know, translation is being brought back into language teaching, foreign language yes. teaching. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and people have to know, you know, it's not, it's not just a checking on acquisition as it was used in the 19th century to a great deal. It's uh, also a creative language process, as you can do a lot with it, and it'll be a communicative activity. Mm -hmm. Communicative mm -hmm. translation mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. we need in the classroom. True. Uh, so does, does, so this the, the, no. Sorry. <laughs> does this represent a, a new turn then, or a new paradigm in our discipline? And if so, what are the main characteristics? Do you know what, yeah. Vanessa, I don't care. <laughs> That's a really honest answer. No, no, I think we've, uh, people mm. in translation studies have done themselves a gross misservice in inventing turn, turn. after turn after turn. Mm. Okay, even the original cultural turn was not a big advance of what had been done mm. in, uh, yeah, in what yeah. Gideon Turi called descriptive mm. translation studies. Mm -hmm. We really need the formulation of very basic problems that have mm. to be worked on. We've got to work together using all the different tools, all the different disciplines to find solutions. Mm. And I don't know if, if a turn implies a problem solving methodology or mm. an identification of new problems, that's fine. Mm. But I would really love us all to work towards mm. solutions mm. rather than pretending to leave the flock of sheep off in that direction or that direction mm. or that direction. Mm. Mm. It's, it's really turned us into a discipline that other disciplines have nothing to learn from mm. because mm. we keep changing. Mm. 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 Fair enough. Okay, and one last question also in, related, in relation to your work, and this time um, in relation to the role of, of accreditation. Do you think that the current climate uh, that we're living uh, with, again, increasing multilingualism, intercultural mediation, do you think the role of accreditation has become uh, more important or less important than ever before? Or, or how do you see accreditation in the new environment, in this new uh, think, yeah. environment. It depends what country you're in, mm -hmm. a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. Accreditation in the United States with the ATA, it's a, a bit of paper you buy, it's a hard exam, 20%, less than 20% pass rate, mm -hmm. and it has a market value. Mm -hmm. So you invest in it, you work for it, you learn for it, and you, ha and you, and you get the returns later on. Mm -hmm. uh, NATI in Australia it works in a similar way because the governments are the main employers, and if you don't have NATI accreditation, you don't get into that. Mm -hmm into that job market. Europe, unfortunately, is sort of in between. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a standard system. The, um, the Chartered Institute of Linguists has its exam system, which is some, but it works in the UK, but outside mm -hmm. of the UK. People are looking at our academic credentials mm -hmm. rather than certification. Mm -hmm. And there, that's dangerous mm -hmm. uh, because We've, we've had a discussion of this recently on academia, and, and I have to be very careful. I mean, there are excellent master's programs producing excellent graduates in all countries in Europe. Mm. But there are also people who scrape by with a 51% pass mm. and are out there and have a bit of paper. Mm, and, right. uh, uh, and I often ask myself as a, as, a, as a trainer, would I give my book to that person to have it translated into a language I don't right. know? Right. Mm. And I worry. So I am 
very much in favour of a system where there is a training program and then external accreditation, accreditation. which is very rigorous. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a good thing. I think the problem is it has to be international mm -hmm. because translators work online for mm -hmm. companies in all parts of the world and they move mm -hmm. as well. We don't have any international accreditation system mm -hmm. and I think uh, the place to start would be the, s the systems that are perhaps the most advanced or the most powerful. Mm which would be working between Australia and China. <laughs> or great. New Zealand as well. Or New Zealand, like, where we don't we'll, have one we'll yet. New Zealand. We yet. don't even have a national <coughs> language policy, so... <laughs> uh, which is perhaps the last question, How, what's the correlation between your work and, 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 national, and language policy making? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know much. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of people who want to focus a lot on translation policy as an area. Mm -hmm. Translation policy has never been anything other than a consequence of language policy. Mm -hmm. And a society needs a language policy because of democratic principles. People have to know what they're voting for when they vote. Exactly. Basically, you have to know what language they've got mm -hmm. in common or what languages we're providing services for. Uh, quite apart from the legal and, and, and medical services that go along with that. Um, okay, so a language policy that recognizes a plurality of languages will, it should lead to government support for accreditation mm. at some level, mm. okay, as it is in Australia. In the United States it's not. Mm -hmm. It's private, but it act, it act, the company works very well. Uh, actually in Australia it's a company that, <laughs> that is owned by government, That's, so it's uh, a different story. Uh, so, so the question is, what's the link? There's an obvious link. If you have a monolingual country, you're going to have nothing happening for accreditation and probably yes. few translation yeah. services. That is exactly what's happening here right now, where uh, I think the Auckland Languages Strategy Group, they're lobbying for a national language policy, and as part of that group, we're sub creating a subgroup that looks into accreditation mainly through government support. Surely language and policy, I mean, New Zealand no, is a not. great success story. <laughs> yeah, seen from Australia, not, you, you guys have got Maori not, language up there no. as co-official. This is this is you know, <laughs> that's why it's well outrageous done. that there's no yes. national language policy, I believe. And I suppose uh, that they will somehow try and and monitor um, the policies implemented in Australia, right? Um, uh, but yes, it is appalling that uh, having uh, the mm. most increasingly super diverse population yeah. in the world that we're still struggling with, yeah. with language policy. Although I was Making surprised. at all levels, yeah. at all levels. Since we're, um, we're going through immigration processes, and my wife is mm -hmm. at the moment, um, you know, you have to sign up for Australian values, <laughs> you know, one of which is the equality of men and women, which, you know, mm -hmm. and the other is uh, English as a lingua franca. You have an obligation to, to learn English to a, to a yes, level that enables right, you to participate. Here as well. Uh, Here as well. Mm. Okay, so that, that mm. part of the policy is there. <laughs> and the Maori but, part is well, there. Well, yes, it would involve that as well, mm. right? All the migrant categories, all the migrants um, trying to, to have democratic involvement in society, right? Language learning, English mm. language learning becomes a problem in the sense that um, some of these new migrants, they don't even have access to jobs. Uh, opportunities mm -hmm. uh, simply because of the cultural background, and uh, and that's another sector that, that would have to be looked but at. Sure, not you're, only you're providing mediation services as a bridge. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the other thing that is clear in Australian policy, at least from uh, Joe Lobianco's, yes, is, is <laughs> the need to maintain linguistic diversity. Exactly. To try to maintain mm. the uh, the incoming languages, mm. very hard to do. But the, the, the evidence in the churches is it can be done and it's being mm -hmm. done generation after generation yeah, in sure. some cases. We shall uh, work towards multilingual democracy then. Yeah. All right. Mm. I think that's all from us. Okay. 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 Just, just one final question. Yeah. So, translation as a profession, what do you think the future prospect of it? I don't know. <laughs> Any thoughts? You train many translators? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there will always be a niche market for the fully professional translator with the Western translation form based on the alien eye and accuracy and quantitative um, invariance. You know, that, that thing will be there. 
mm. but it's not the kind of service that's going to solve our huge social problems, mm. I think. Mm. Mm. And I, I think we really have to uh, pick up a term like mediation, mm -hmm. and spell out what it means and what skills are there and how we can train people for it and how people can use mediators uh, in order to address a wider, more pressing social issue. Right. Yeah. All right, well, with that, our thanks to Professor yeah. Penn. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank 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 you